on. Uh, did you want to give us an update on what you've been doing the last week or so? Or Yeah, sure. Do you guys want to see a little video? Oh, always. Yes, please. I'm down for that for sure. sure. All right. Let's see here. Do you <laughs> have to share screen at all? You might have to, yes, or um, we can enlarge your screen if you want to, like, play it and, like, off your... Oh, yeah, yeah. Or something. Okay, so I got to hit present. Uh... Yes, sir. Then the share screen. Let's see if I got the right one here. Um... All right, can you see that? Oh, yeah, look at them coils. Yep. Okay, so this oh, is I the 700. Yeah, this is well, you haven't seen this particular video, but you've seen this coil. This is the one that's in my uh, yeah, my uh, superconductor series, so to speak. So, um, this is the 750 foot by filer coil. And what I've got on the secondary is a hairpin circuit. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to light this beam. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but this is uh, an yes, sir. Okay. So at the bottom of the screen here, this is an LED grow light beam. It's 150 watts. And I'm going to light it with 27 volts, uh, 261 hertz. But I'm going to light it with 2.1, sorry, 2.5% duty cycle just at first. And it, it doesn't light up bright, but I'm going to incrementally go up from 2.5% duty cycle to 5% then to 10%. And then I'll show you my max 50% duty cycle and you'll see the difference. And watch the watt meter. So here we go. This is the 2.5% and I'll bring up the watt meter so you see how much I'm drawing. So to poke the tiger, a full illumination, 150 watts on this strip. Go ahead. Yeah, 150 watts full, right? But that's not full, it's uh, about 20%, right? Lighting factor. But now I'm going to turn it on to 5% duty cycle, 261 hertz, 27 volts. And again, I'll show the watt meter. That's 5% duty cycle. So just honest feedback, from the view that we are looking at, it looks like it's pretty darn dim. It does. It's about 30% bright. It looks much less from the camera view. Yeah, the camera loves to correct, eh? Just to let you know. Now that's starting to look like we're getting somewhere. That is 10% duty cycle and still no watts are showing up on the moon. My mirror. eyes tell me that's approximately 20 watts of power. It, if seems I have to in person. it seems much brighter in person, I'll tell you. <laughs> so this is the 50% I'm going to show you, and you're actually going to see watts on the watt meter. But this is a 50% duty cycle. The current's here. being generated in the coil. Yes, it is. Yeah, And that's, that's where 50 the current's being generated. Cycle. That looks You're like about 45 voltage. watts to 50 watts. Oh, oh, that's actually what it is. Yep. Okay. <laughs> that's now, here's power. the thing. On camera, what, what you're seeing looks like about 45 watts, but I can't look at that light. It's blinding. And if I run it through its regular ballast, it's not much different. But now, again, I will show a video with the regular ballast. I don't have one keyed up. So I can't do it now, but I'll put it on my channel and I'll show the comparison so that you can see. So then, like you said, maybe you can gauge, maybe it's 50, maybe it's 40, 
just by looking at the video, you might have a, a better chance of seeing that. Yeah, this is one of those cases where a photon meter happened to be one of those necessary tools that both you and I would be using. Um, just look at the luminous output of an LED Absolutely. source. So okay, we so both have a little bit of work to do in terms of getting ourselves a calibrated source. Yeah, there's a few tools that I could use to uh, show a few things. Now, there's one other quick video I want to show. That's possible. Let's see here. All right. Share screen. Okay. So let me back this up a little bit. So basically what I'm going to show here is it's the same experiment, but while I'm lighting the lights, what I'm going to do is show the movement of the magnets. And it's going to tip both ways. And all I'm doing is turning it on and then shutting it off. That's it. That's all I'm doing. And you can see how the magnet will move. So I crank it on really quick. Oh. And then I crank it on again. Uh, FYI, we are not seeing your screen. No, now it's up. Now it's oh, up. you're not seeing it? Okay, so I got start. it up now. I got it up. We're good. Restart that whole thing. Okay. From the beginning. So, again, I'll crank on the power for the lights. You'll see the lights come on bright. But watch the magnet, what it does. So it flipped to the right. Now I'm going to turn it on again. And it's going to flip to the left. Did Hard you, to see. So, did you about, invert the, the polarity to the input, or did you? Nope. Do? Ah. Very interesting. And then it inverts again the other way, and it's, it's spinning. Yeah. It should be symmetrically disposed, so if people think, well, it's on the right side versus the left side, realistically, that's supposed to be pretty much symmetrical as long as it's equally to the right as it is equally to the left. Well, according to, to the ruler, it is. Now, I could be off a couple millimeters, not so sure. But uh, as far as a rough experiment goes, I'd say it was pretty dead on. But the coil generates a magnetic field. It, uh, it actually generates a magnetic vortex, and you can see it. I have it on multiple videos where the magnet starts spinning, and then it follows the outside perimeter of the coil, just like a force field. Mm -hmm. And when you stick it on top, it will literally spin around the top of the coil. Nice. At first, I, I thought it. his table was tilted. The first time I seen the video of the magnet... And what looked like it was rolling around the outside of the coil, I thought, well, the table is tilted. It would just take that path. And then my brain suddenly realized the table is tilted, perhaps, but it's not curved. Why is the magnet taking a curved path instead of simply a straight path? Yeah. And it curves right around the, the coil. It's because the, the vortex that is produced on the inside of the open core of this coil is in the opposite direction as the uh, vortex that's produced on the outside of the coil. Crucial information right there. It just seems to stick a little so you got a double... in its exact equidistant spacing to the outside of the coil. It's like once it fixes in at 12 millimeters, it seems to stay exactly there during the entire rotation. And you've got an MDF table there. It's well known to be a pretty crappy surface, all full of imperfections and bumps and everything. Which yep. almost acts as if, well, that magnet is stuck somehow in a superposition and locked to that spacing. Yeah, it's a countertop. It's uh, the experiment's interesting. I'll I'll say that. <laughs> I'm gonna do a full presentation, hopefully very soon on APEC. Maybe, maybe in a while after. I don't know. We'll see. And I'm gonna explain everything in detail, like how it's built. And then what it's based on, it's based on uh, dichotron instability, uh, basket winding, proximity effect, parasitic capacitance. 
It's uh, the skin effect comes in to play big time. Fractal design, and so does kinetic inductance. So these things that it's based on is what makes it work. Without any one of them, it wouldn't work at all. Yeah, I would have never had that vision had you not taught me what you taught me. So, uh, so you're did genius. you see your own right, Jeremiah, by far? So, Gerald, so would you really say that? Uh, so, sorry, if it's a vortex, you could use it in a tor toroid. Could yeah. You? Yeah. Yeah. So you can okay. make like a ferromagnetic fluid spin in a toroid. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure. I haven't done the fluid thing, but uh, I use ferrite cores for pickup coils. That's how I get a lot of my energy out of the, the vortex itself. Yeah, that's pretty useful what you just hey, did. Hey, Gerald, uh, would you say... Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, would, yeah. Uh, would you say, too, that, you know, you're saying the skin effect, uh, would it be fair to say that the vortexes have a... Uh, like a electrostatic property to it, not just an electromagnetic property. Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, electrostatics is part of how the skin effect works because in between the two layers of copper, uh, think of it like um, energy is flowing one way and then it's flowing the opposite way at the same time and they're crossing paths. So it's creating like a static moment almost. Yeah, I'm not sure like if a, I'm explaining like that longitudinal. Question. It'd be longitudinal because uh, Tesla was saying that in between or in between the uh, longitudinal wave, there's electrostatic field. It's kind of like a, it's like a double. It surrounds the longitudinal wave itself. If anybody would like, I can add to that. In yep. terms of the Go ahead, Jeremiah. So it's a relativistic amplification effect, and it has to do with the observer reference frame. So if you are calling an electron the observer where it's positioned and its velocity relative to another electron, the way that the two electrons will see their fields is going to be entirely dependent on their velocity, acceleration, and angle to each other. Hence, angle makes a huge difference, and so does conductor free electron drift velocity. So it produces what Richard Van Durek has lovingly titled a geometrically amplified relativistic field. And yeah. between the two, we've got our red and blue arrows, which is one of the things that I showed uh, previously, just to kind of animate how what your coils are doing, Gerald, and the things that we've talked about it gives a possible explanation. I'm not saying that it is the explanation, but this is basically what happens when we interpret the mathematics into a two-dimensional cross-section image between a set of 90 degrees conductors. And I will, and it's this image, you know, the one that we've looked at before. So our it's a gyroscopic blue, sphere. Right. So our blue arrows are the nominal electric fields. They're symmetrical from the center position of a stationary electron, but the red arrows are occurring because at the bottom we see a blue vector acceleration arrow and at the top we see that the blue vector arrow at the bottom is slightly beneath the red arrow whereas the blue vector arrow at the top is just about overlapping the red vector arrow at the top and the two on the sides well they're equal so from the outside positions it seems like our electron has a stronger electric field than it should otherwise have because it's been experiencing acceleration and because it has relative velocity to the well the little purple electron or proton on the right side and the one on the top gives us our other vector arrows that's as in the blue and red um, axes arrows that are directly down from the top circle they're what that circle sees in terms of the relativistic electric potentials so and this has everything to do with geometric amplify potentials and it has to do with relativity and the Lorentz transform. Of course, we have to get rid of the gauge factors. The gauge factors remove the possibility of a physical epsilon and mu modification in free space and real warp drives. So if we account for that and integrate what is already in general relativity, we have a full picture. Well, it's funny you say that too, because this coil doesn't just do 
what you're seeing or what I've been showing, it does a whole lot more. The If you can control a vortex, an electrostatic electromagnetic vortex, and you could vary your um, electrostatics in comparison to your magnetics, right? I'm just saying this for layman's terms, so to speak. There is so much that you could do with this technology. It, well, what is the, anyone uh, who starts out at this is going to be writing encyclopedias about it. That's how much you can do. I'm not saying my coil. I'm saying this technology in general. What RPM are you achieving? Do you know? RPM? What do you mean? Well, it's a vortex. So it's oh, well, I don't know. I've never... Uh, <laughs> Uh, honestly, I've never uh, done any measurements like that. I've never considered that. When I turn my uh, coil on, say, at 261 hertz, and I'm holding a neodymium magnet, I can feel the vibration of that pulse. Yeah. If, if I put it at 7.813, that magnet will spin at 7.83 hertz. Oh, yeah? It's yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I would, I would be definitely interested to know the maximum speed you could reach. Uh, well, I mean, uh, no, not like crazy speed, but just like okay, Well, it's weird. It's uh, the magnetics disappears after a certain frequency, and it just starts giving you energy. And in fact, once really? you get to a point, yeah, yeah, you convert from epsilon okay, the and u to k and g. So I was wondering why with like uh, the, um, oh my goodness, Matt, the right I'm just going to step up. No worries, Mike. Um, we'll be yeah, here. I'm just going to uh, step up for a quick smoke right back. Oh, for sure, brother. Uh, that at certain frequency wave, um, it would the magnet would stop spinning in the center, or stop moving around. And you're saying that instead it's going into a straight energy uh, production, yeah. And if production. when you get into the even higher frequencies, it does other things. I'm just gonna I mean, say, is that why we saw some interference with the camera uh, when it was? Yeah, being... that's part of it. I can't. <laughs> that's another oh, thing. I can't oh, turn man. it down. Sorry. I was just complimenting Phil on his observation of noticing the affirmations in the camera. Not yeah, I didn't think anyone would that. pick up on that. Good job. Oh, no, man. I did. I just didn't say anything. That happens all the time when I have uh, different uh, monoatomics around sometimes too plugged in. It's, it's crazy just how much it actually affects in the with these... Like plasma EM fields it creates, I guess. Well, but I you, wanted... have, you have an electric field and a magnetic field. Of course, it's going to create radiation, you know? Well, I wanted to show you guys a lower frequency, but I can't because it shows up in the speakers of my stereo and computer. And that's from like 10 feet away. So yeah. I keep it at a certain frequency. That way it doesn't affect things. But, uh, I mean, uh, if you could put like a... A gravimeter or uh, like a I use a I use an EMF meter. I pick up the magnetic field and the electric field and the radio frequency field. I get all three. It just oh, depends yeah. on at what frequency I'm pulsing. And uh, what is that again? Sorry, it's a tri it's a tri field meter. That's what, what I use. But the, the frequency, what is it you get? Uh, the one I'm using right now is 261. That experiment was 261 hertz. Could oh, I ask you to show yeah, you your nice. field meter? People are getting pretty curious. Sure. Let me just... And let me ask you another question while you're going ahead and finding that. If somebody were to provide you equipment or resources to pursue your work, yep. would you accept them? I would. I would have to discuss with that person what sort of uh, um, expectations they had and what expectations I had, so to speak. But, yeah. Okay, so let's see if I can show you the tricord and tri-field meter here. Um, oh, I got to switch my camera. Hang on here. <laughs> 